All right, guys. Hey, welcome to the Sky's the Limit call. My name is Stephen e. I am your host today. Uh, I'm very excited to be able to interview a young man that's been killing the insurance business, uh, Michael Herman. Michael recently got started with us. He works with Easton Patton. Uh, he works with Zach Tradowski in that group, and he sells a lot of insurance. So I'm actually very excited to be able to have him tell his story and to be able to see how he's killing it, literally. So, Michael, you hear me loud and clear? Oh, yeah. Good to go, brother. What's up, dude? So give us the lowdown. So give us your 30 second story, man. Of, uh, yeah. Of everything. So 30 second story. Um, been in the insurance industry for gosh, been in the game for quite a while now, but more of the financial planning side of things. And I'll never forget the first time I met you, Stephen. I told you that I was 50 percent at 50 percent comp and I was at 25 percent comp. I'll never forget that. And so um Came to FFL actually this week marks one year officially with FFL um, and been traveling around around the country. It feels like all the time on travel trips and things like that. Um, I consider hotels my, my uh, hometown now. So I've basically gone all the time. So, right. So you came in, what was it like about a year ago, less than a year ago, middle of the year last year. And yep. you came out immediately and started writing like what 40, 50 families protected, like, the people, the, the question that I usually get, Michael, is like people, like how do people come in and write at such a high clip? Like, obviously, we have the same leads, same comp plan, you know, same training. But what allows an agent like yourself to be able to get out there and protect 40, 50 families? Is it a schedule? Is it discipline? Like, what, what do you guys do so differently compared to the rest of the company? Yeah, I think schedule and consistency is the main thing. Um, and I think it's one of those things that you have to be organized and plan ahead. Um, I've talked about this before, but there's a book out there that talks, there's a quote in the book that says begin or quote in the book that says begin with the end in mind and making a game plan for what you want your schedule to look like, breaking that down by, you know, month by month, week by week, day by day kind of thing. Um, and really kind of figuring out what structure works best for you because everyone has their own things that works best for them. We're just lucky enough to work with a lot of successful people that are really good in different areas. And so I've kind of just taken a little key points from everybody and kind of made it my own, um, and made my own schedule that way. So I think schedule and consistency, being on the phones by, you know, 7.30, 8 o'clock, dialing until, you know, the job's done. Um, I'm sure we'll get more into that stuff too. But I think the biggest thing is that if you can keep a good schedule and control your schedule, because as independent contractors and, you know, 1099 employees, um, if you want to even call it that, your own business owner, um, you make your schedule. So if you're going to have a schedule, you might as well stick to it. So so talk about your schedule. Like what is, what is, I mean, you protected a hundred families in a month. Yeah. So like, for those of you that want to know what that means, that's like the average commission is like a thousand dollars a pop. So like, yep. you can kind of guess what he made. Um, but like, what was the work like that, you know, the schedule, like what, what did the day-to-day -day activity look like? Like, I'm not looking at the whole, but like, what does Monday look like Tuesday look like in order for you to yeah. be able to write that type of production? Yeah. And I think, I think the, the thing is you have to have leads. And if you don't, if you're questioning yourself, whether you have enough leads, you probably don't have enough leads. Um, and so I'll start with number one, obviously having leads and especially for going back a little bit where I came from in the insurance industry, great company, I have nothing bad to say about it. Like I said, did more of the financial planning thing, but that was all referral based. Right. And so with this, you have leads, leads are your source of income and leads are how you get in front of people. And so, I mean, Monday for me was, you know, dialing from, you know, seven thirty, eight o'clock until, I don't know, until noon or so. And this is something that I've started telling myself lately is that I'm not going to allow myself to go eat lunch until I know lunch is going to taste good. I know that sounds <laughs> cheap, you know, weird, like that. but <laughs> having a bulk of your appointments done before noon, because lunch is going to taste a lot better when you have 15 appointments at noon, rather than having five, six or seven appointments, having to come back on a full stomach, then you're just going to dread the rest of the dial day. Right? right. And so what I've started doing is right now I'm sitting at, <clears throat> I've been dialing since eight. So about I don't know, just over four hours of dialing. I got 14 appointments on the books for the next two days right now. Um, after this call, I'm going to text all my old leads in this area, text all my old leads. And I put together a little text script for people. Usually I pick up another three to four appointments through text because some people just don't answer their phone. Yep. Um, and then what I've started doing is doing that. And so I'm going to get to 20 appointments for the next two days. And I do a lot of travel trips. And if I'm talking too much, you can stop me if you want. Nope. But Dude, you're the guest <laughs> trainer for a reason. So what I do is I try to have a bulk of my appointments done by noon when I eat my lunch or have my lunch delivered because I pretty much literally do all travel trips. Essentially, um, I shoot text to my old leads and then I'll dial back through my leads one more time until I get my 20 appointments. And then what I just started doing this last couple of weeks 
is when I'm on travel trips, I have nothing else to do. Honestly, maybe do some recruiting, social media stuff, but I actually go door knock on dial days now to try to book a couple extra appointments for the next two days. Wow. If I get into the house, great. If I don't, I try to schedule an appointment. And this just this last weekend on Thursday, I door knocked in the middle of a hailstorm and booked two appointments, sat with both of them and helped both families this past weekend. So, wow. Resolving every lead, literally. Correct. Right. Correct. Um, kind of share with us. So like you're booking 20 appointments for the next two days. Are you running 30 appointments a week, 40? Like what's the number that you guys yeah. are? So for me, minimums, obviously 30, but for me, minimum schedule, minimum is 30, but I'm shooting for 35 to 36. Um, I will say I'm just kind of getting into consistency with that because at the end of the day, I'm running a lot of, you know, as we know, mortgages slowed down and I used to run a lot of mortgage. Now I got a bunch of final expense mail and internet leads. And so I'm just trying to give myself as many at bats as I can, you know, going to the free throw line as many times as you can, you know, the golf range. I try to tie everything back to sports. Nope. And so I'm just trying to give myself enough at bats or enough chances to be successful. So, so that's the other thing, right? A lot of people go, Oh, you can only write that type of premium. If you have, you know, mortgage leads, right. um, internet leads, Facebook final or Facebook leads, everything. Like when I was in the field, I went to hall of fame, you know, like my whole thing was, I just wanted a client that knew I was coming over for life insurance. Like I didn't yep. care if, you know, it was a final expense lead because I've written big premiums of final expense. My biggest final expense premium was like 450 a month, right? Yep. Like I've written big, um, you know, mortgage protection. Mm -hmm. It's like, dude, I, I didn't care what the lead was. I just wanted someone that knew I was coming over for life insurance. And yep. so like, that's like a big myth that a lot of people try to place on Hall of Fame producers. Oh, it's because they're running mortgage. And that's like furthest from the truth, right? Can you like dive into that? Yeah, for sure. Um, and I mean, I have a ton of ton of friends and people, you know, friends, coworkers, whatever you want to call it, people we work with, they kind of become your family, hence family first life. But, um, you know, honestly, I mean, I'll tell you, so I don't think I think I've told you this before. I know we talked about in Denver at the sales conference. I think the biggest house ever was on a door knock that I've ever had most families help, you know, in translation. Um, but I had uh, when I was my third or fourth month in the business, a three month Internet life lead off the CRM help the equivalent of 23 families in one house off a three month internet lead. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, I like just what you're saying, man, people hit hall of fame on all types of leads. Right. I've actually really enjoyed the final expense internet leads. So it's um, a little more now than mortgage. I still appreciate a good mortgage lead. We all do. Right. But it's a grind and I love the grind and I love that part of it. Um, and so I think that you can find premium anywhere. If you find a why right. something that's also, and I'm sure we'll hit on this a little bit. Um, but when you're on the phones and you're booking the appointment, I'm always asking them my last, my tie down. I don't ask them to grab a pen and paper. If you do that and it works, keep doing it. But for me, my tie down is asking them who their beneficiary is going to be. Hey, mm -hmm. Steven, who's going to be your beneficiary tomorrow when I get over there to help you out with the life insurance? It's going to be my, uh, my wife and my kids. Okay, perfect. I'll see you tomorrow at five. Like that's my perfect, that's my perfect tie down. Because at the end of the day, it'd be really weird if you're doing something that's going to help your family and then you no show it or cancel the appointment. Um, the other thing I've started doing too in home is I compliment them and I say, Hey, Steven, um, you know, obviously where I'm here for the life insurance request you sent in, it sounds like you're a pretty big family, man. Is your family important to you? Yeah. Yep. Of course. Perfect. Well, I know your family's really important to you. It's very honorable that we're going to be taking care of this today to make sure that they're in a good spot. If they lose you, I'm complimenting them because right. I want them to know that they're a good family person. What do good people do for their families? They get them life insurance. Right. So. I love that. See, that's, that's a million dollar nugget right there for those of you. Like, like everybody ties down differently, right? Like I'm a grab a pen and paper type of guy, but like, yep. that was really good. Who's your beneficiary? Who are we leaving this to? Like while you're on the phone with them, that's actually really, really good. Um, so, you know, going into your phone script, can you run through, like, do you have, that? that's what I want to find out too. Like, do you have one phone script for all the lead types? Do you change very much? Like, what do you do when it comes to the phone? <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, I think it's a little different, but it's all the same, right? Yep. It's a little different from as far as like a mortgage protection mailer to a final expense internet life lead, whatever it may be. Um, but my, my thing is I'm just trying to clear their schedule for my schedule. Um, I assume most people are working, even if I get a final expense mailer or internet lead in that's like 70, 75, 80 plus years old. I say, hey, Stephen, I assume that you're probably still working, right? No, I'm actually retired. Okay, perfect. So if you're retired, I guess, what's the typical schedule like for you? So I'm asking people what their schedule is like and trying to, trying to, you know, instead of looking at it as like, hey, I'm going to make my schedule around your schedule. No, I'm going to clear your schedule for my schedule, right? right? And so if someone's working, what I'll say automatically is, hey, I assume you're probably working eight to five Monday through Friday. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, got it. 
well, I obviously can't see it during the day when you're at work, but I got a six o'clock or a seven o'clock, which one works better for you? Right. right. I'm clearing their schedule for my schedule because I have a six and seven o'clock. Yes, I could book them during the day, but at the same time, they're not going to be home, not going to be available. So I'm finding out what works for them. And then what's, we'll your, work. what's your appointment, Gab? Are you running every hour on the hour? It depends. So I run, um, I run, gosh, all literally all around the Midwest. Um, it depends if I'm running just strictly final expense mail, I do it on the hour okay. or final expense, you know, internet life leads. I do it on the hour. If I do mortgage, I do an hour and a half. Got it. Um, but I always tell new agents, I think you should start on like an hour and a half to, to give yourself enough time in between appointments to not feel stressed. You know, if someone gets declined, you got to call people in home. You can kind of fine tune what works best for you. Um, I'll be honest, I used to start, I used to go on the hour and a half for like the first six months until I got really comfortable. Um, and then if I'm running, you know, mortgage mailers, mortgage leads, it might be every hour 15. But when it's when it's pretty straightforward, final expense, I mean, I'm on the hour because I'm usually in and out in 25, 30 minutes. Um, and then I'm hitting the door on the way over the next one, trying to book an appointment or just get inside somewhere. I do also tell people on the phone, hey, can you give me a 10 to 15 minute gap either way, um, just to make sure that I'm able to help the family properly in front of you guys. I'm always giving myself permission to be late just in case I'm quick in and out and house hitting a door knock. Um, I'm always giving myself permission, like I said, to make sure that I know they're going to be home, but giving them a heads up that I could be running a little late. Right. That's a lot. Uh, so. No, that's good, dude. That's really good. And, and see, that's the other thing is like, this is something that I learned when I was running face-to-face -face appointments was like, I rather be late than sitting in a parking lot at McDonald's waiting for my next appointment. You know what I mean? Like that, that was like the worst feeling ever. Cause if I got back to back, no shows, that's how I got big was I would be like, all right, I'm at McDonald's. I got to order food again because I'm at McDonald's, right? Like, so um, that, that's kind of what happened. So like what I realized was running every hour, every hour 15, it accounted for drive time, it accounted for no shows. It accounted for me being late. And I always booked in windows. Like I always found out that like, when, like, for example, when we got our home, right? Like the cable guy was like, we'll be there between 10 and two. Yep. That's what I did. I waited from 10 to two because I wanted the cable. Yep. You know what I mean? And it's like, if the cable guys does that to us, like, why can't we do that to our clients that this is way more powerful than cable, right? Like going, Hey, I'm going to be there between 11 and 12, not, Hey, I'm going to be there at 11, like giving yourself that window. Cause if you showed up at 10, 11, or one or 11, 45, you're still technically on time. Yep. Right. So like, that's, that's what I did a lot when I, when, when I was in the field, but um, before we dive into your presentation and, and some of the things you do to like overcome objections, like what's the balance? How much are you doing face-to-face -face versus virtual? Like, have you done both? Have you done one or the other only? Like, what is your balance on that? Yeah. So I was all face-to-face -face, face -face at first when the first part, when I came on to FFL. Um, and then I did a little bit of like the live transfers and things like that. Okay. Um, got into that. Didn't mind that. Um, but I am more of like a touch and feel it kind of person. Like I want to shake someone's hand. I want to be in the home. I want to be in that kind of connection. Needless to say, though, I don't think there's anything wrong with either way. I think obviously we've talked about this, Stephen. People have success and are crushing it both ways. Right. Um, I've just found that the in-person in works better for me because I can really bring more emotion into it. Um, and I can actually speed up the process. And so for me, and we'll get into it, I'm sure, with in-home, but I'm just so incredibly assumptive on the phone and at home, right? And so, but I think that it really, the assumptiveness is super helpful in person when you can really see the emotion behind it. And so I try to run everything in person. Um, I mean, I'm going on five weeks now of a travel trip in hotels. Tonight, I got to go to the laundromat and do laundry. Um, <laughs> so I'm out actually out in uh, Rapid City, South Dakota. So if anybody knows where like Mount Rushmore and like Sturgis Bike Rally, that's where I'm at right now. So nice. all over the place. I love it. Um, cool. So like, have you found out like, because you've done both and it's better for me to ask someone that's done both. Yeah. Do you get bigger premium face to face or do you get bigger premium? doing gosh dude it just depends um i think if you find a why and you find a need it can be done either way um i remember one time i had probably split with another another uh agent probably 90 uh 90 mailers split between another agent like six states over from where i live um and so we just decided one weekend we we're gonna hammer him out over the phone and i wrote equivalent of five families in one home over the phone on the spot right and then also in home, I've written, you know, my fair amount too. And so, dude, I don't think it matters at all. Right. You can find a why, you can find a need. Um, I mean, you can write as much as you want either way, I think. So I love it. I love it. So um, let's dive into your presentation, right? So 
do you do anything special? That's the other thing I wanted to ask you. Like everybody goes like, oh, they, they must be having some special in-home script or in-home presentation. Like break it down to us. Like when you meet with clients or when you're doing it over the phone, like step-by-step, step, what, what is Michael doing at the door? What is he, what's he doing when he, you know, shows up? What does he show him? All that stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll just run through like exactly everything if you want to real quick. Yeah, um, really. And so I, you know, knock on the door, get inside, obviously, or the phone's a little different, but it's all the same right? It's only weird if you make it weird. Um, and so I knock on the door, you know, Hey, Michael here for our appointment. Okay. Come on in. Um, I always ask to take my shoes off no matter what, because I won't let them to know that I respect them because I'm in their home. Um, I've heard agents that don't do that. I've heard agents that do do that. I think you have to set, there's a, there's a, there's a boundary of respect, right? They invited us over, they filled the card out, whatever it may be. Um, obviously if you can sit at a table, you sit at a table, we all know that. Um, but in some circumstances you, you're maybe not able to do that and that's okay. Um, and what I do right away is I just hand the, you know, the little card over and say, Stephen, um, is this you that filled this out? looks like your handwriting. Yep. Sounds good. Okay, perfect. Um, and then what I always do on the card, I always write who their beneficiary is going to be because I already have their beneficiary and I want them to see that. And that's also why I like in home because I want them to see all that and feel that right away. Um, and then what I do is I just get out my state license, say, Hey, I'm just the state license underwriter here, obviously in, you know, in South Dakota, that's you know, assigned you to go over this with you quick. I just like to show you this. So I'm not just some random fellow off the street. You usually get a little chuckle from there, that. Um, and I just say, well, real quick for you, Stephen, um, obviously you told me yesterday on the phone, you filled this out because you want to make sure, you know, your wife and kids are taken care of if something happens. Um, so I guess just so you know, there's like 30 different companies here in the state of South Dakota that do this for folks. doesn't matter which company we go with. It's just whatever company is going to give you the best rate for the best price. And I tell you right there, Stephen, this is actually what I think really helps me right away. Because sometimes people are wondering if it's free, right? Whether whatever kind of lead it is. So I'm setting the expectation right now, Stephen, we're going to find something today that number one, the coverage amount makes sense, covers what you're going to have covered. God forbid something happens to you. And number two, and most importantly, in my opinion, we're going to find something that fits in your monthly budget. Because at the end of the day, if it doesn't fit in your budget, it doesn't make sense for anybody. Does that sound fair? Right, it does. Okay, perfect. Um, and then I get out my little suitability sheet, show them, hey, I'm going to go over your age, income, health, current insurance, kind of doing the shop around for you. And then we're going to figure out what makes the most sense. Does that sound fair? Yeah. I always ask them, does that sound fair? Does that make sense? I'm trying to get them to tell me yes, so many different times during the appointment. Um, I'm trying to get them to tell me yes, literally 10 to 15 to 20 times, because no matter what, if I continue to get them to tell me yes, 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 this makes sense. Once I close, I mean, it's, they're going to pick something. They're not going to give me the pushback. Um, and rarely do I get a lot of pushback if I do a really good job setting structure in the appointment. Um, don't get me wrong. Everyone misses. It happens from time to time. And at the end of the day, if you can really look and figure out why you missed or why you weren't able to help that family, at the end of the day, like that's on you, not them. Right. Um, that was a big thing for me that I struggled with. It was getting frustrated early on with clients being like, oh, they just don't care about their family. They don't have money, whatever it may be. It's never anyone's fault besides our own. It's our job to come over there and help them. They filled out the request. They invited us over, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, so we just go through the financial inventory, um, you know, reassure them that we're going to find something that's going to fit in the budget for them. Um, you know, I might ask, you know, what does that look like tomorrow if you're gone? Um, they kind of fill me in whether they want to be buried, cremated, et cetera. Obviously, maybe income replacement or, or knocking out the whole mortgage if it's a mortgage appointment. But I think the best thing that I've learned when I've kind of made it my own with what I do is um, when I'm doing like the close, essentially, I think everything's super basic and straightforward for the most part. When you're going through the presentation, there's nothing special about it. As long as you're super assumptive, like, yep, we're going to get this taken care of today, allowing them to tell you yes, like I said. But when I show them numbers, what I do is really, I think it's really powerful. And I really think it's kind of made a difference for me. The, fam the month I was able to protect over 100 families was the month I started doing this, coincidentally. And so I've just stuck with it. Um, most people are three option numbers or people. And so I always show three options for people. Um, I don't think there's anything else anybody should do. Um, especially if you're a new producer, because if you're just trying to show one number, you might get the door real quick. <laughs> and so, um, I write down, I write down the numbers, um, obviously three numbers, but then what I do on the right side of the sheet of paper, I write it down. I write, it's called, I write benefits and underline it. And what I do there is I write hundred percent tax-free death benefit. Again, you're, I'm writing things in there that are important to them. So like 100% tax-free death benefit, day one coverage, because as you guys know, we probably all ran into a lot of policies that are set up poorly. They're put on a graded plan for someone who's completely healthy, doesn't take a single medication. I mean, I ran into that literally four times this past weekend, right? And so I want them to know that it's going to be day one coverage. 
you know, I'm writing that it's a 15 years level plan or, you know, level plan price never expires, covers the final expenses for the financial burden. Um, and then more than anything is going to give everybody a good peace of mind. And so I write all that stuff down on the piece of paper that I'm going to flip around to them for the numbers. Um, and I'm making sure I read all the benefits to them before they see the price, because at the end of the day, this was a huge coming to for me that at the end of the day, the cost of the insurance does not matter as long as they know what it's going to do for them and their family. God forbid something happens. No cost of insurance ever matters as long as it's something that, you know, protects their family if something happens. And that's within reason, obviously, because it has to fit in their monthly budget. But if they know no matter what, you're going to find something that fits in their budget, they're going to pick something. Um, I always try to downsell people too. I'm sure you guys talk a lot about this. I always try to downsell people to start somewhere because I always tell people a little bit of something's better than nothing. Yep. Um, I mean, I'm just super straightforward, simple. Um, and I just try to do a really good job structuring exactly what I want them to say. I want them to tell me yes. I want them to keep telling me yes. I don't want them to go off on any tangents. I use very closed ended questions. They're going to result in the answer. Yes. Does that make sense? Does that sound fair? And I kind of just guide them into the application. The other thing that <clears throat> I've started doing recently too is after I go through the financial inventory, because I let them know there's like 30 different companies and is this, a, you want me to keep going? Yeah, dude. No, this is good. Keep going. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> um, I've guided people, you know, through the financial inventory, I've guided them in the direction of like, Hey, we're going to do something today. Um, but there's like 30 different companies. And so I, before I even show them numbers, I write a ton of America. <laughs> a lot of people try to write America. I actually run them through the initial now because I want the, I want to get a past the objection of social and personal information before I even show any numbers. Cause I don't want to waste my time and I don't want to waste theirs. Um, I let them know it's just for the insurance company to run that initial prescription check. That way they can put me in the right spot for you. That again, for you, Steven's going to give you the right amount of coverage for the least amount of premium. So I run them through the initial first. If they get kicked from America, I pivot from there. But most times, obviously, if it's good underwriting, you're going to get them through the initial part. They've already seen the process started. They've had to sign your, your, you know, tablet, computer, whatever, one time before, give you their social once I get that, I mean, it's, it's game on, right. In a good way for them, because they're going to get some coverage. See, that's the reason why I was a big fan of America. Like people always go, man, like you understand underwriting. I'm like, no, I don't. I just threw it in America and see if they took them. Like if you gave me a med Michael that I didn't really know. And right. I'm like, mm, I don't know. Let's see if America takes it. And then what I would tell the client, I'm like, Hey, just like when you buy a home, you have to get pre-qualified for the loan, right? Like before you can go shopping for a home, you got to see how much you're approved for Let's see what America says. The only thing I need is your social for you to sign. And then they'll let us know immediately within like 15 seconds. If it pops up and says that we're good to go, we'll proceed. If it doesn't, we're going to go somewhere else. And like, that was my underwriting. Yep. You know what I mean? Like that was what I did for underwriting for the longest time. And so like, that's why people always go like, Hey, like I use that. Like if, if they, you, it, Trey taught me this early on. If people are taking medications, let them know it's not a good thing because not everybody takes medications. Like healthy, healthy folks don't take medication, right? So like Trey was like, dude, if they take eye drops, make it sound really bad. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and so he'd be like, you take eye drops? Whew, all right, hopefully they take that one. And I'm like, you, you do not do that, right? And he was like, no, I uh, definitely do that. <laughs> and he was like, because what if you scored it too much or too little? I'm like, I guess, right? And so like, he wanted to put that in their mind so that when they went through the pre-check and they took them, they're like, well, somebody already took me. Let's just continue. You know yep. what I mean? And that's the reason why, like for most of us on this call, we love writing America because nobody else would do that. Nobody will give you a decision before asking bank info besides America and prosperity sometimes. You know what yep. I mean? So like that was such a big deal for me. And that's how new agents should underwrite. Like sometimes like when people go, hey, do you think America will take them? I'm like, the answer is clearly no, but you still got to teach them throw it in and see what they say. Right. Right. And so that, that was, that was money, man. Um, I love your in-home process being very simple, right? Like, cause everybody like the, like I was looking to see what can a brand new agent not do? And I'm like, dude, you're asking questions on a suitability form, a financial inventory. Like that's not hard. Any right. That, right? Um, and then laying out the benefits of insurance. Like most of y'all have passed the insurance exam. So you should know it's a tax-free death benefit. You should know that there's, you know, benefits in there like living benefits and such. So um, when you do the three options, what do you notice that they pick the most? Like middle, top, bottom, which which one do you see you think yeah. they pick you the know most? What's, cra what's crazy about that is it's pretty straightforward across the board, no matter what type of lead, honestly. 
Um, and honestly, more times than not, they pick the bottom option. I'll be honest with you. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, what just happened, they got coverage. You know, my family is going to get paid pretty well, probably. And at the same time, too, there's room for um, room for upping it. I always let people know, like, hey, we can always. And I get asked all the time, man, like, hey, can I add more coverage? Can I add more coverage? I'm like, dude, yes. I've probably had in the last three months, 10, eight clients call me to increase coverage. Wow. Because at the end of the day, I think if you provide so much value of what the insurance is going to do for them and their family, I say them because it's more of like the peace of mind. Like I talked about, everybody needs good peace of mind. It's the peace of mind that they have the insurance coverage, but what the insurance is actually going to do is do something for their family. If something happens, dude, I can't tell you how many times like they're like, Hey, can I, can I add more? Can I add more? Yeah, you can of course add more, but we're going to start here. And clients really appreciate that. I think because you're taking the sales part out of it, right? I just do the underwriting. I mean, I'm just here for you. And I've had so many times people be like, hey, you should do sales. And I'm like, yeah, maybe I should, right? (laughs) So, (laughs) uh, but at the end of the day, dude, sales, it's not sales if you're doing a good job. Yes, in some degree it is, we get paid extremely well. But if you're providing value, I mean, it's it's so clear and easy. So long story short to answer, probably the middle one or mainly the bottom one um, with always room for growth. And I feel good about that because a week later, I'm not gonna see a chart back, right? I yeah. always want to do what's in the best interest of the client. And whether people think it's real karma or not, I've had it happen in my life. I, I am super big believer in doing the right thing for people all the time because someone else is always watching. So I love that. And see, that's the thing is like, the reason why I asked you is because like when I was, when I was running the field, like I want to say on a scale of a hundred, 60% of the people took the middle one. Yep. 35% of the people take the lower one. And then like 5% of people take the high one. Correct. Like those were like my numbers kind of. And like, Correct. here's the other thing. Like, I love the way you said it. You were like, dude, if like, they were like, you should be in sales and like, little do they know. Right. But like, but here's what was crazy. It was like, for me, if you did it right, the customer bought insurance, you didn't sell them. Correct. And so like, I was like you, I, I actually was talking with Zach about it when Zach used to be in Vegas. I was like, Dude, I used to talk people down premium. And my pitch was, let's say they chose the middle one. I'd be like, that's a little tight on your budget. I think you should start on the lower one. And then what we'll do is let's just get you approved on that one. And if, the, if your situation gets better in the next month or two, I'll call you back on a follow-up and we'll just increase it back to the middle one later on. Yep. And they're like, and I'll, I'm always like, dude, because if I was in sales, I'd pitch you the highest one and make you keep it. But I'm right. not. And then what happened was like, I would call them a month or two later and they'd be like, I'm so glad I got the bottom one because like, if I would have got the middle one, I wouldn't be able to afford it. how to cancel it. Yep. Life happens. Flat yep. tire, fridge broke, AC's out, whatever it is. Right. And so for me, that was so big talking people down um, yep. because it was kind of like, I'm on your side. I'm just tr- here trying to get you approved. hundred percent, man. And I think at the same time too, to add to that, I think that what I tell people is I leave like a little business card summary sheet with everybody. And if you guys don't use that, I don't know, maybe you guys do, but I can shoot it over to you what I use. Um, but I use a little business card summary sheet that has a recap, mm-hmm. uh, my personal information, my phone number, my fir- first name, last name, um, the company we went with the policy number, the premium draft date, uh, the amount of coverage. And then I list all the benefits again, actually on that little summary sheet, because at the same time too, dude, I actually think it saves chargebacks sometimes because it'd be really weird, Steven, if I just took care of your family and a month later, you got out this little piece of paper I left you. You now have your policy in the mail and it says it's going to take care of the financial burden if something happens to your family. It'd be really weird if you called me to cancel, right? Granted, it does happen, but I think it saves a lot of chargebacks because people have to feel emotion with these things. I mean, dude, I mean, we've talked about family stuff for your family, my family, things like that. I mean, dude, like if you you have emotion, there's some sort of value tied to it, right? Um, And so I'm a huge believer in that stuff. See, but here's the thing, like, if you didn't leave that sheet and I came in, I'm killing your policy. 100%. Like, yep. I want y'all to understand that. Like, I put so much doubt in my clients' heads if, when I was running face-to-face because I'm like, they're like, oh, I already sat down with someone. I already bought something. I'm like, cool, pull it out. And they're like, well, they didn't leave anything. And I'm like, Mary, like, you bought something, gave them your social, gave them your bank account information, and you didn't, they didn't leave you anything behind? They're like now that I think about it, no. And I'm like, whoo, that wasn't a good decision. You know what I mean? Like I right. did things like that to try to solidify my policy. Cause if somebody tried to do it to me, I'm like, no, no, no. The policy is going to come in the next seven to 10 days. But if you need to know what you bought, here's a sheet that explained everything. And I wrote everything kind of like you said, I call it a 
I called it a client leave behind because I was leaving it behind for a client. And it was right. carrier policy number, type of policy, amount of coverage, my phone number, effective date, premium. Like I wrote that on a piece of paper and I slid it in their folder and I left it behind to them because I was like, that's the most important piece. You know, right. and the policy never came because let's just say the, you know, post office messed up or whatever it may be. At least they still have that. All that information is on there for them to be able to call the carrier if they needed it. And so, no, man, that, that's such a big deal. Like little things like that increase your persistency and soften up chargebacks because, you know, at the end of the day, I always say it's, it's not how much you write, it's how much you keep. Correct. You know, there's a lot of people that write a lot of insurance, but a lot of it falls off too because they don't, get, they don't do a good job retaining it. So that was a million dollar nugget right there, man. That was really good. Appreciate it. Yeah, that's been a huge game changer for me. I think so. Absolutely. So, hey, if you guys have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or the Q&A, but I'm going to, I want to dive into some more stuff with Michael. Um, what's the number one objection you get in the home? <clears throat> you know, I think, I think if I, if I get an objection, it's the, it's the got to think about it question. Um, and I'll tell you, like I said, I think the only times I get that question is if I didn't do a good, good enough job creating the value. And that's 100% on me, not them. Right. And so what I really think I do, and when I said going back to in home before we're talking about objections, um, when I ask people, does that make sense? Does that sound fair? I get them to tell me yes so many times. I'm basically just guiding them exactly in the direction I want them to go. Right. If I'm doing a really good job. Because at the end of the day, too, is if I'm getting an objection, I didn't create enough value. And so, I kind of maybe have to, because I don't want to be on step eight if they're on step two, if that makes right. sense, right? I don't want to be on step eight when they're on step two, because step eight's the, the next part. Step nine is the application, right? I don't need them to just be like, hey, why did I fill this out again, right? right? And so if I get an objection, I have to kind of go back and kind of resell again to them, which I'm more than happy to do. And that's what we have to do as, as underwriters, right? We have to create that value, bring that emotion in again. Um, I think it's the thing about an objection you're not going to get everyone to move forward. And I think that's what people have to realize about top producers. I mean, people that are writing consistently 50, 60, 70 K a month, even 40 K a month, not everyone is telling them yes. And that's made up in volume and numbers and running appointments and activity. Right. Um, but it's probably the think about it objection, but then I just try to create a ton of value. Like, Hey, if you're gone overnight, what's the bare minimum that you think would be helpful to leave behind. And I'm just downselling from there. I'm just downselling from there. And if that 40 bucks a month, Hey, it comes down to the the price because it's always the price, right? If it's me, let me know. I've never had someone say it's me. Who knows? It could be me tomorrow. I don't know. It's never the value of the insurance, right? Because I'm trying to do a good enough job creating enough value, right? If I need to go back and create value again and explain everything, it says all the benefits right there. But if you want me to run over them real quick with you again, I can. Um, so it always comes down to price and people always say that. And so Okay, so if the 40 bucks is too, you know, too much for you for half the mortgage, let's just lower it down to maybe a couple months of income replacement. That way she at least has something that's going to give her time to make a decision. Does that sound a little better? Perfect. We'll go with the one that's 32 bucks a month, whatever it may be, right? right. And so at the end of the day, I just got I keep saying that, but you just got to figure out what's best for them and what works for them because if you if you write a lot of policies that are, you know, I mean, I would say that the home run final expense policy is like between like 50 and 80 bucks a month. It's not super sexy. It's not going to get you paid a bunch of money. But if you sit with, you know, eight, nine, 10 people a day, help six or seven of them, you do the math, right? Right. Um, I mean, my my final expense, like average premium right now, I think in a house is probably seven, 800 bucks, which isn't a ton. It's below the average, but I make up through it in appointment and numbers, right? So. But see, that's the other thing, like pre-COVID, that's what we had to do. Like yeah. I, I tell people all the time, it's like pre-COVID people that had, mortgages weren't available until after five because they were working at a job. So if you were a full-time life insurance agent, you were running final expense internet leads from eight to five or else you wouldn't have any appointments. You know what I mean? And so like, I love that because um, like, I remember John Wetmore taught me this early on. He said, if you're running a final expense appointment, it's a half an appointment. Every two final, expo uh, final expense appointments equals one regular appointment because of no shows, because of premium because of the lead cost, because it's way cheaper. So like, if you're running strictly final expense, you can double up just to be able to write the same premium as someone that's writing like premium leads, right? And so, and like you said, like your average premium right now, running a final expense appointment is 700 bucks, 800 bucks, but the average premium for a regular sale is about 1200 to 1500, right? So that's, that's what they mean. Um, we have a lot of questions that 
are coming up that I actually really like that I want to dive into. Yeah. Um, Marjorie said, how do you schedule your business trips? Like how, how do you book them? What's the structure on them? When do you dial? What type of leads do you get? All that good stuff. You can dive into that. That's a really good one. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. So like I said, I basically do stuff all, I mean, it's almost all travel trips. I live in Minneapolis now. I'm originally from Nebraska. Um, gosh, man, I don't think I've slept in my own bed more than 20 nights in the last four or five months. Like I think I've told you that already, but okay. I think people need to understand like, Hey, travel trips are fun and they're great. Um, because, that, because I think like at the time of a travel trip, I don't know, I'm sitting in Rapid City, South Dakota right now. I don't know a lick of anybody here. Right. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to work and I'm going to grind away. Right. And so I schedule my travel trips, kind of plan them out because over time, you're going to kind of get to know your lead flow. Um, you know, how many leads are coming in at this time of month. I keep all my old leads because I like to text all my old leads. And like I said earlier, I can pick up an extra three, four, five appointments for two run days through text. And in text appointments, or excuse me, when I text people, I'm very clear that this is for life insurance. And if they respond, they tell me, no, thanks. Perfect. Leads resolved, right? That's the way I like to resolve a lot of my leads. But to get back to your question, as far as planning, uh, you know, business trips, travel trips, I try to be extremely organized with how I want my month to go and what I want it to look like, right? And like I said in the beginning, if you know what your month want, you want your month to look like, you got to know what the week's going to look like, you got to know what your day is going to look like. And so I'm trying to plan out, you know, book my hotel, because if I book my hotel, I got to go anyways, because I don't get the refundable hotels. I just don't. It's a mindset thing for me, just makes me have to go and makes me have to work. Right. Luckily for us, we, we have our CRM system and, you know, I've started utilizing like those smart financial leads and things like that. Um, and so you can get leads from almost any lead platform, especially our CRM for somewhere. So if I need to supplement, you know, an extra 40 to 50 leads, that's no problem. Right. And so I think there's always going to be enough leads. It's just a matter of being organized with where you're going to go. Um, and so for my travel trips, I usually try to get there the day before to give myself time to settle in, you know, get ready to rock and roll, um, be ready for dial day. And so like, I just, I was in Bismarck, North Dakota, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, left yesterday, drove down here to Rapid City, South Dakota, um, got organized and everything ready to go last night. And now I'm down this morning, right? And so I think if you can be really defined or really good about your own schedule um, and plan ahead and get there and give yourself a shot, because you have to give yourself a shot for success. And if you're waking up at, you know, seven, eight o'clock, starting down by 8, 30, 9 o'clock, like you're just not going to have success or at least the success that you can have. Um, something I've started doing too lately, I've been kind of trying to refine my own schedule as well and make adjustments. Um, and I think that's super important because I mean, I've talked to you, Steven, a good amount, Easton, Zach, I mean, Andrew, Sean, all these guys, they have all their schedules and what works for them, but they're always making adjustments. Right. And so for me, my thing is now I do a, a morning walk without my phone, without my Apple watch, without any technology or anything. And I try to plan out my day and how I want it to look. Right. It sounds super cheesy and weird, but if you give yourself that time to be disconnected, yeah. absolute game changer for when you're trying to get connected. So what did you, so that's the other thing, like people go, you know, why would you run a travel trip or whatever? Maybe, well, part of it is because you might not have leads or you might right. not, you know, have enough leads where you live. Um, or the other thing is because when you get out of the, your hometown, you actually have to work. Like that was right. why I did it. Um, yep. How much business did you write this past week and how many families did you protect in yeah. North Dakota? Because for people are like, why would you run in North Dakota? Dude, you know, I love North Dakota. Right. But that's, <laughs> okay. I, I know that. But I'm like, everybody else, oh, they're like, why? Why is yeah. it North Dakota? It's South Dakota. Yeah. So in all, uh, all final expense, internet lead, final expense, internet leads, I wrote, you know, equivalent of helping 11 families out there. Um, and Over it was all weekend. correct. Yep. Over the weekend. And it was 11 or 12 applications for 11 families helped. And again, it's nothing sexy or anything like that. Um, but they talk about they preach attitude and activity, as long as I'm always doing something that's some sort of money-making activity. Right. And so, I mean, when I was out there, I mean, like I said, I dialed all day, you know, most of the day morning on Thursday, sent texts, got on our team call, went out and door knocked literally in a hailstorm. I booked two appointments, right. And I helped both of those families this last weekend. And so I think you're right because when you're on a travel trip, like what else are you going to do? Right. 100%. And so I think if you haven't done a travel trip, you should do a travel trip. If you do the travel trips and you really enjoy them, do more of them, right? As long as it's, it works for your family and your schedule and things like that, because your back's kind of up against the wall on a travel trip. I mean, I'm, you know, this right now, I got $2,500 worth of leads. I got six, 700 bucks for the hotel, food, et cetera, gas. I mean, I'm already in for, you know, 4K. So I got to go help some families now to make sure I get paid to make sure they get protected, right? So. Well, let's yeah. just, I mean, let's just talk about simple numbers though. So you protected 11 families, 
this weekend, you have 15 appointments already for the next two days. You'll probably end the week at like 17 to 25, my guess, right? Mm -hmm. And so like people go like, well, why would you do it? Because you can go make that type of money in a week. Right. You know what I mean? Like most people yeah. work jobs for like years and they don't make that. And it's like, <clears throat> you got to make that in a week. So it's like, I always tell people, it's like, would you fly to North Dakota to pick up a bag of $20,000 of cash? Yes. Okay. That's what a travel trip is. Exactly. You have to add the work to it though. You know what I mean? I and so um, I like adding travel trips into my schedule, like once or twice a month. Reasoning mm -hmm. behind it is because you get an influx of cash. Yep. Like I can run in my backyard and write seven to 10 grand or whatever it is. But like, if I go run a travel trip, I know I can bang out 12, 15, 20 grand in a weekend. Like yep. I know that, you know what I mean? So I love that. Um, Arnold asked a question. He said, how do you decide where do you go for your travel trips? I think the thing I did to decide where to go for travel trips is I just got with Easton. Easton's the one who hired me um, and just kind of went through, you know, areas that are open, maybe some of the leads he was getting off, things like that. And I, I just said, you know, I'm willing to do whatever it takes, and what I got to do, you know, to get this done kind of thing. Right. Um, I was very hesitant at first for a first travel trip. And my first travel trip went absolutely horrible. It probably couldn't have gone any worse. So if you think yours is worse, mine's worse, I promise. Um, and so I just kind of figured out that um, I just want to go to areas um, that I was familiar with. I'm from the Midwest. I like Midwest people. Um, I've gone to the East coast to do travel trips. They're great people as well, but I really like kind of being around where, where people are that I know. Right. Um, and I have a lot of, so actually it's a funny story because you're a sports guy, right, Steven? Yeah. So I go to <clears throat> Fargo. I'm, I'm super open with telling people where I go. I go to Fargo, North Dakota and Bismarck, North Dakota. North Dakota is really known for North Dakota state football program. Won like eight national championships, right? Mm -hmm. it just so happened that I went to high school and grew up playing sports against the quarterback that won all these national championships for them. The one after Carson Wentz. Right. And so my tie to North Dakota, I just say, Hey, I'm, I know who Easton is. I'm friends with them, that kind of thing. And, uh, we grew up playing sports against each other and they just automatically just love me. And so I'm like, all right, I'll keep going to North Dakota. Right. So, <laughs> so, um, you know, you just find connection and find the people you like. Um, the nice thing is for a lot of my travel trips, I can drive. It's all within driving distance. I was in Fargo, shout out to Bismarck. Now I'm down in Rapid City. Now I'm, then I'm going to shoot over to Sioux Falls. And so, I mean, I'm all over the place, but it's all within driving distance of, you know, three, four hours for me. Anything more than that, I probably will hop on a plane. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of where, how I decide where to go, where the leads are at, where the people are, I feel real comfortable with. Um, but it also is good to get out of your comfort zone. Don't get me wrong. So. Yep. I love that. Um, one of the questions from Brandon, he said, what are you doing to protect your mental as you work and get better? Ooh, that's a high level dude, question. Great, great question. Um, and that's exactly why, Brandon. Dude, I look up to you, by the way. I've seen all your trainings. You're the man. Um, and also, I think you won the slingshot, I think, down in Vegas. Yeah. Or not Vegas, in Scottsdale, right? Won that. Um, so, you know, that's a great question. And I think that's why I've started implementing those morning walks for me. I just try to clear my head, clear my space, reconnect with my why and why I'm doing this. I love people, want to help people. And at the end of the day, if you're in this for just strictly to make a ton of money, yes, you can do that, but there's not really a kind of a feel good connection for it. And not like a feel good connection. That's kind of cheesy and weird at all. My why is different than your why, Steven, my why is different than Brandon's why, right? We all have our own why, but if you can become connected with that on a day-to-day -day basis, it makes the grind a lot more enjoyable and it makes putting in those long hours. I mean, currently I'm probably working 60, 70 hours a week, which is even less than some people but it makes it so much easier if you're clear in the mental space and you're connected with what's your why, what's your purpose, that kind of thing. And so long story short to answer your, uh, answer your question, Brandon, um, those morning walks have been a game changer for me. So, yeah, dude, that's why some people wake up in the morning and, you know, four or five in the morning to go lift. Why? Cause you're not talking to anybody. You're spending time with yourself. Yep. Dude, that's that like, Oh man, let's dive into that real quick. Like you spend more time with yourself than anybody else. <laughs> you all have to figure that out <laughs> right so right. like you got to treat yourself right like and and some like one of my mentors taught me this when i was 19 he said hey i want you to sit there and shut your mind off for five seconds and i was like what he's like i just want you to sit there and like try to quiet your mind for like a minute or two and i was like it, and i'm sitting there like all right don't think nothing and then i'm like what do i want to eat today what am i going to do and it's like your mind just keeps running right like that's what happens and so He's like, it's not really possible, which is why you need to think positive thoughts and try to control the narrative. And so like, that's the whole like love on yourself and, and all that stuff, because it's so vital in what we do, you know? So I love that. Great question, B. Um, 
when you're booking appointments for travel trips, do you already have a set number of appointments? Do you, when do you travel? Um, do you travel the same week? Do you book them before you go? How do you do it? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I have tried both and that's why I've kind of figured out what works best for me. And like we talked about, Stephen, we've talked about this. The cool thing is you literally get to work with all these high level people that have had success, <clears throat> but within that you get to figure out what works for you. And so I've tried it both ways. Um, but for me now, like I said, I get here the day before and I dial today for Tuesday, Wednesday, right? Because that, because I think I want to give myself kind of that pressure in a way where like, I got to get here and I got to get to work because it'd be really weird if I was satisfied with eight appointments for the next two days. Right. And then I just went, you know, messed around the rest of the day. Right. And so I like to get there because the money's already spent. Now I got to go make some back. And so that's how I look at it. Love it. Um, how do you know what amounts to list for your three options? This is from Maria. <clears throat> yeah, great question. So I think depends on the type of uh, appointment. Um, and so, and I don't know, I guess I'll just real quick run through kind of how I just two, two quick seconds. Um, so for mortgage appointments, if it's a younger couple, I usually show hundred percent, 75%, 50% typically. Um, if it's mortgage protection for, um, for an elderly couple, that's just trying to get some, you know, some mortgage payments to help out while the transition of social security pension, whatever it may be. I used to write down the coverage amount, like this will cover $12,000. This will cover $18,000. This will cover $24,000. That doesn't really mean a whole lot. Yes, it's helpful, but I create a lot more value by saying, hey, this is going to cover two years of mortgage payments. Yep. This is over a year and a half. This is going to cover a year. You guys have all probably already gone through that, but I think there's a lot more emotion and connection real reality tied to covering the period of time rather than just having to sit there. Okay, this is this, 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 this. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and then for final expense, what I'll ask them is, you know, you're looking for something small like, you know, 10, 20, 30,000, or what are you kind of on the hunt for? Um, and they'll say, oh, I just want, you know, 5,000 or, you know, 8,000 to cover cremation or whatever it may be. And then in that situation, I'd cover, I'd show five, eight and 10. Um, and I probably know they're going to pick either five or eight. Like we talked about, they usually pick the middle or bottom option. Um, I just want to show, show them their options. I already know which one they're going to pick anyways, because it's the one that fits in their budget. Um, but I want to give them options. And sometimes I actually tell people that um, I know you're looking for five, Stephen. I'm going to show you a couple of different options, though. And so when I show it to you, I say, hey, they just require me with the state to show you three different options. That way they don't think I'm just trying to sell you one specific option. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. OK, cool. I love that. Dude, yeah. I, I, man, like I learned this tip from Nina and I was so pissed when I learned it because I was like, it was so simple and it made so much sense. So like for those of you guys that are running appointments face to face and you have to do or even virtual when you do the Americo pre-check, especially when it comes to Eagle Premier, it goes based on what we see, we will approve up to 30,000 of level death benefit, right? Yep. And so like, I was listening to a conference call that I had no business being on, which is why everybody should attend calls because uh, yep. you don't know what you don't, you don't know, right? And so right. Nina was like, hey, like my clients will select 14,000 and she'll be like, hey, hey, Mary, like this company pre-approved you for 30. Do you want to see what 25 or 30 looks like? And if they said no, you still have the sale. Yep. But if they said yes and go, yeah, what does 25 get me? You know, I like that. I oh yeah. my. So no, this is what Michael, this is what pissed me off. So I, I was like, yeah. I'm taking that in the field. That very next weekend, I probably wrote an extra like four grand in premium. <laughs> yep. For asking one question, literally uh, one question. Hey, you chose 14, but they pre-approved you to 30. And then they're like, well, what does 21 cost? What does 25 cost? What? And dude, anybody knows you're just going to Eagle and just changing the numbers. And then they're like, yeah, we can swing that. Okay, cool. Let's do it. Boom. That extra minute made you another four or 500 bucks. Right. Well, and if you know it's going to fit in their budget anyways, it's not going to matter, right? Right. That's so, awesome. Yeah, I, love I, I was so upset when I found that out. I was like, awesome. how did I not know that? Um, <laughs> Great. Last question before we wrap this up. Uh, how do you stay motivated, particularly during the hard days, the hard weeks, especially when you're brand new in the beginning? Dude, I think you just got to come connected with your why and what your purpose is, I think, with this stuff. Um, I think that you have to figure out what that is because it's a lot more than just you, right? And um, <clears throat> from experience and had a, you know, a couple death claims here and there, but I'll, I'll leave you with this, I guess. So my, my uh, I told Stephen this before, but so my dad got sick last year. He's actually back in the hospital last night, went to the hospital today. And so I was sitting here actually this morning when I was going on my walk, I was walking and I was thinking to myself, I said, so do I either feel really bad about being gone because my dad told me not to come home 
do I feel bad about being gone or am I going to make something of this? He said, and he said, he's the kind of person that's like, go do, do what you got to do, right? Take care of your business. I'll be fine. That kind of thing. And so I just remind myself every single day why I'm doing this kind of thing. And this is complete business has completely changed my life um, from a perspective of a financially, again, financial finances and money doesn't make you happy, but it allows you to do things and allows you to have right. freedom. Right. And so my big purpose and why is being able to help my parents with their monthly bills. I mean, my mom had to take work off today. My dad's probably going to be out of work for the whole week, that kind of thing. And so I just remind myself of that every single day that when the bills come for my parents, I don't want to even have to think about opening it and looking at their own bank account and saying, Hey, how are we going to pay this? I want to be able to do that every single time for them. So that's why how I remind myself every day and stay motivated. Man, that's awesome, man. So when I, um, man, so when I, um, like sometimes people go like, why do you work so hard? Yep. You know what I mean? And I'm like, because dude, like, and Trey shared this with me. He said, if the problems you have in life can be struck away with the check, it's not a problem. Yep. You can't fix cancer, man. That's not a problem. That's a real, I mean, that's a real life challenge. Being behind on your bills or whatever it is. Yeah, that sucks right now. But if you can stroke a check and the problem go away, it's not a problem. Yep. And it's like, sometimes people go like, why do you work so hard? Like, I remember when I was running travel trips, driving three hours one way to run appointments just to be able to go, be gone for a day or two. And people were like, man, why would you do that? Why would you leave your family? And they just didn't know. And I remember when my mom got sick, like really sick, I was at like every doctor's appointment and the doctor legitimately was like, dude, what do you do? I'm like, I'm an insurance agent. And they're like, what does that mean? I'm like, I don't know, but I'm here. You know right. what I mean? Like to be able to be like, I'm so financially set that I can write my own pen to cover my parents' bills, to cover like everything. And like, when I was going through that, man, I was like, was it worth it? Yeah. Yep. Because like, can you imagine if my mom was going through treatment and I'm like, hey mom, because I didn't work too hard a year or two ago, because you're going through this now, I gotta be driving three hours to run appointments because I didn't work hard a year ago. Like, I didn't wanna do that. And Sean Mike says it all the time. It's like, you're one appoint, you're one family emergency away from being bankrupt and that is facts and if you don't take care of yourself now and stack cash and build a team and do that stuff you can't take time off it's not possible yep. you know what i mean so like michael i love that man i, I appreciate you for sharing because dude it's a different feeling when you can stroke a check to fix a problem and it's just money mm -hmm. we can always get money back we can't get time back with the ones we love we can't get things back with other people but if it's just money you can always earn more you know what Dude, I mean? hundred percent brother. And I, uh, I love you, man. You're the best. And so the, uh, it's crazy too, because we got a big family kind of event coming up here in October down in Florida. And, um, there's some people in our family that have been hurt by what's going on financially right now. And, uh, I just called them up and I said, Hey, I want to pay for your, you know, your ticket down there and that kind of thing for our family event. And, uh, it was actually, I'll show you this, my brother. And he called my mom and he's like, why is Michael offering to pay? And because my brother doesn't know, I don't, I don't, right. he has his own stuff going on his own world and health wise for him stuff too, actually recently. And, um, my mom just said to him, it's fine. Michael, Michael's going to take care of it. And so he shot me a text last night and I uh, read it this morning, <clears throat> not to be like emotional, but he's like, Hey, I love you. I'm so proud of you. And I've never heard that from my brother before. So, so it's cool stuff. Man. Hey man, I appreciate you. I didn't mean to get so deep and emotional on this call, but this, this is what the business gives us, man. And, and so like when people go like, why are you guys so gung ho about this? It's like, dude, yeah, the insurance is nice and protecting people is great. And the money we make is awesome. But it's like, at the end of the day, your lives can change. Um, and, and only the ones that are crazy enough to believe that can actually go do it. You know what I mean? So um, I appreciate you, Michael. Thank you so much for taking you know time out of your travel day just to be able to you know spend an hour with us. But it was very, very valuable. And if you guys... The best compliment you guys can give Michael is whatever he just taught us on, go implement it. Like that's the best compliment you can give a trainer is application of the knowledge they just passed on to you rather than going, oh, that call was cool. Like, you know what I mean? So Michael, thank you once again, brother. If I can ever return the favor, anything I can do for you guys, man, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. I love you, brother. Thanks, brother. Have a great trip. Yes, Excited to Thanks, see your numbers for the end of the week. We'll talk to you soon, man. Take care. Thanks, Take man. Take care, guys.